So, in recent years, um, textile art in, in particular that's been produced by rural women, generally very uh, marginalized communities of women, um, has become a means to generate income for themselves, for their families. And particularly in our research this summer in the states of Gujarat and Rajasthan, we visited a number of non-government organizations that encourage textile production by poorer women um, as a means of income generation, but they've also succeeded in, in empowering women in a number of other ways. Organizations such as the Self-Employed Women's Association in uh, Ahmedabad, the Kutch Mahila Vikas Sangatan in Bhuj, um, and a number of others give workshops, they provide materials and space for textile production, um, but they also run training sessions in things like political leadership, um, they host agricultural service centers, they initiate village health camps, um, they act as mediating partners um, for um, organizing in this group of informal laborers and etc. So in this talk, I want to consider the implications of some of this work um, in terms of right, financial empowerment, um, the lives of women, but also what does this mean for the type of art that is being created? Um, does this relate to you know, what is happening to traditional forms in the face of, of art as an income generating means? Um, and what is the status that these, these women take on when they um, uh, become a part of these, these NGOs? Um, so we're starting off in Rajasthan, and in particular, so this is Rajasthan in the state of India, and the <coughs> first woman that I'd like to introduce you, this is where we were down here in um, Udaipur, very close to Gujarat, where we spent much of our time. Um, and this is a um, lovely woman named Lakshmi. Um, she's 42 years old. She started working in, for Sadhana in 2002. Until that time, she was basically a homemaker. She, uh, her husband worked in a local factory uh, in Udaipur, and she and her husband are actually both from West Bengal. They're from a very, they're from very different part of India. Um, she is the oldest of seven children. Um, she describes that when she was growing up, she had a great deal of responsibility in the household, and as she told me, she received the maximum beatings. Her father was something of a drinker, and her future husband's family, basically what happened was they got him drunk, and they convinced him that their son was from this very wealthy landed family, so he married her off, and when Lakshmi married into the family, um, and discovered the truth. Um, her father said he would try to help her and support her, but that she was not to be come back to the natal home. She was, would not be welcome if she tried to leave her husband and come back home. At that time, she was 13 years old um, when she got married. Lakshmi's, uh, Lakshmi's husband was working in a tea stall in West Bengal and um, a, sort of a tea runner until some of his friends told him that there was some better paying work to be had in this factory outside of Udaipur. So he moved his family to Rajasthan in 1986 and he worked in this factory for 15 years. His salary um, in the factory was about 35 rupees a day, which is less than maybe when he was working there it was about a dollar a day. Um, and that's what, that was their bread and butter money. In 2002, the factory closed, and he was laid off. And without this income, the family had nothing. And this is when Lakshmi um, decided to join Sadhana. She'd heard about the work of Sadhana and decided to join it. And she got together, I'll show you some more pictures of her, with uh, a group. She formed a group um, because women, to join these kinds of NGOs, they generally have to join in a group. And usually what happens is, a number of women from a single village or a single community who are all having the same issues will come together and they will apply to be a part of one of these groups. They will receive training and then if the, their work is deemed to be of high enough quality, they will be given employment. So Lakshmi spearheaded um, a group to join <coughs> Sadhana and um, uh, she became the first 
head of the group, the, the groups, and again, this is very typical for the way that these NGOs work, um, this, each community selects a leader for their group, and so Lakshmi, as the founder of this particular group, became the first leader. Um, this took them some time uh, to go through the process of organizing the women, bringing them together, applying to be uh, work for Sadhana, um, to get trained. Um, but she was determined to make a success of her life. And more importantly, she was really determined to get her children educated. So after receiving training and beginning work, she became the group leader and um, she continues to be very important, although she's no longer the group leader. Uh, Lakshmi and her husband have three children. Um, now their ages are, she has a son who is now 24 years old, and she has two daughters. One is 21 and one is 19. Until she began her work at Sadhana, um, her children were at a government school. Um, generally, these are very inferior schools. But once she started to earn income through her work with Sadhana, um, she was able to shift her kids into a private school. And she was able to pay for their private school fees. Um, now, all three of her kids are in college. So the boy, her oldest daughter, is um, working on a uh, master's degree, actually. She's working on an MCOM in company secretaryship. Her son is uh, working on his BCom degree, and the younger daughter um, is also working on a BCom degree. So I think this is a pretty remarkable um, event for a woman who was married at 13 and never went to school. Um, she, this is uh, pretty remarkable. Um, the other thing that's really quite interesting is that none of her children are married yet. Um, and she is, um, well, her neighbors have warned her, right? You're, you're, you'll never be able to get your daughters married because they're going to be far more educated than any potential groom from within their community. But Lakshmi says she doesn't care about that. She's not worried about that. She thinks it's much more important for her children to be educated and to be able to support themselves financially. And then, you know, marriage can come later. And that is a pretty radical, um, I think also a pretty radical a shift as well. So she really believes that, especially for the girls, it's important for them to have a good education and to be able to support themselves. Um, she's just a lovely person. So because of the income that she's been able to earn through Sadhana, she's, she pays her kids' university fees. She's also been able to buy um, gold jewelry. She's sort of stashing that away to be for her daughter's dowries. Um, she also has been able to amass savings, so she has a savings account. A while back, she also um, bought uh, her own plot of land and a house. And at the time when she purchased it, um, it cost 12,000 rupees. Now it's worth about um, 24 lakhs, so that would be two, what is that, 2,400,000 rupees. So it's really, um, it's really, that's I think about $42,000. Coming from a situation where you know her husband was earning a dollar a day, this is a pretty, you know, fantastic change in her circumstances. Um, nowadays, last year she told me that she earned um, about sixty-five thousand rupees um, working, doing her work with Sadhana. Um, her husband has not been able to find another. Um, that's not her husband. That's a. Um, the chap who works in the shop there, but her husband has not been able to find another stable job. So he, um, he works as a day laborer. He basically does construction work. Um, he earns about, he can earn about 350 rupees a day. Um, and during parts of the year, he can usually, he can usually get about 20 to 25 um, days work a month, but during the monsoon season, which was when I was visiting them, he's only able to get about 10 days work a month. So it's Lakshmi's income that is what they live on, um, and it's what has made their, their circumstances possible. Sadhana is typical, and the opportunities of Sadhana, typical of a lot of the, the NGOs that Cynthia and I visited in late July and early August of this year. It has its roots in another organization called Seva Mandir, um, which is a leading development organization um, that's based in Udaipur. Sadhana has become, since its founding, um, a kind of independent entity 
and it's owned basically, it's a sort of cooperative, it's owned by the women who are the artists who contribute. And so um, they started off initially with 15 women and today there are about 697 women from 49 different um, communities and groups who, um, in a number of different villages, as well as in Udaipur, who work with them. Um, they create um, a variety of textile products that are, um, in, almost all of them incorporate signature um, uh, embroidery work, and some of them also include appliques, saris, uh, and particularly home furnishing kind of objects. Women are paid per piece, um, and the, the amount that they are paid is based upon the intricacy, uh, the difficulty of the work that they are given. Um, but they're also paid dividends twice a year from the profits, whatever profits are left over is divided up amongst the women. Um, all of the handwork, all of the embroidery work and all of the applique work, all of the handwork is done in the individual homes of women. And this is important because, again, many of these women are coming from very conservative families where working outside the home just would not be acceptable at all. Um, because of their work, they're also eligible to take part in the employee state insurance scheme, and that provides medical coverage for the entire family. Um, they get benefits like three months maternity leave, um, which we don't even have here at UAB. So, um, <laughs> in addition to their handy work, handicraft work, the women can, and, and Lakshmi is one of these women who's chosen to do this, they can work in um, one of the two shops that Sadhana has. They have a shop in Udaipur and they have a shop in um, Delhi. They also, uh, and this is very typical of what, the way that NGOs help to market women's um, art, is they, um, have exhibitions, um, they call them exhibition come sales, right, where they'll take work to different parts of India and show them and, and sell them. And so Lakshmi has also taken part of that, and that's a pretty, um, that's a pretty big and bold thing to do, too. It means that these women are traveling, you know, without their husbands, without their families, in just as groups of women, and going to parts of India that they would never, in their original circumstances, have had an opportunity to do. And so, it's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see the, the kind of changes in the life of someone like Lakshmi um, that these kinds of work um, have made possible. Um, Sadhana usually does about 25 of these exhibitions a year. Uh, for the Adivasi women, um, sort of indigenous groups of women, for low caste women and, and these certain kinds of communities that are, um, who are employed by Sadhana, there have been, as you can already tell, really dramatic uh, changes in their lives, both economically and in terms of the social context of their environments. And one of the most significant differences is to do with this feeling of self-respect that they feel and that they in turn earn from their families and from their communities. And many of these women, and we really encountered this in Gujarat, they ultimately rise to become a, a kind of political power within their villages, within their communities. Uh, women who in the past would have been veiled, many of them, and who very often wouldn't have left their homes. Um, have, have you know, really changed the whole nature of what it means to be a village woman, in, at least within their communities. And that, for them, I think, is the, the biggest advantage. I mean, the income, of course, is essential. But this, this sense of self-respect is, um, is very, very significant. Um, many of them are the primary breadwinners of, for their families. Uh, many of the women who work with Sadhana, again, they previously would have been completely restricted to their homes. Um, and would have been veiled when outside, and now for many of them that is not the case. Many of the children of these women are now able to take uh, advantage of much better educational opportunities, and again, this is especially important for women, for the girls, who in the past you know, might have been educated maybe up to fifth or sixth standard, maybe sixth grade, but now many of them are being going all the way through 12th standard and even on into university. And, that's incredibly significant as well. The school fees, um, even in a lot of situations, right, where in general public school is supposed to be free, 
but you have to buy the uniforms, you have to buy supplies, and if your kids are in school, they're not earning money anywhere else. And so even though India has this free education system, it, it's not easy for, for very poor families to take advantage of it. So um, this income is really important. Another, I think, really interesting change that's come about um, by working in these groups of women is that sect and caste interrelations have uh, really undergone um, dramatic shifts as well. In the past, in, at least in this area, Muslim and Hindu women, or women from different castes within Hinduism, they would have had nothing to do with each other, basically. They, you know, you wouldn't drink out of the same water vessel, um, or you wouldn't sit near each other when you were eating, and that's all changed. These women are now, you know, they go in, they go to each other's houses, they attend festivals and weddings in each other's families. Um, so that um, some of the conflicts and some of the sort of unspoken divisions in the culture have really broken down. Um, all of the women employed at Sadhana have a bank account. And that in itself is, is pretty radical. Um, they receive their pay once a month by, by a direct deposit into their accounts. And that means that these women have banking savvy. Um, they know how to go into the bank. They're not intimidated by it. Um, this is something that you know, the poor and the tribal peoples generally don't have this, this knowledge, this experience. Um, banking knowledge is something that's going to become very important because government subsidies are going to switch very soon. Right now, um, there are a number of food subsidies that, that poor people can get. But the government is, is quickly going, pretty soon going to be switching to, instead of giving actual foodstuffs, they're going to be paying money into bank accounts. So people like Lakshmi and her family, who already have a, a familiarity with, with banking and with electronic banking and with that kind of environment, um, really have a leg up. Um, now the Sadhana brand, what they produce consists of a lot of home furnishings in particular. They do clothing, they do kind of related items like handbags. These are um, items that are predominantly of interest to urban Indian and to Western consumers. In addition, as I said, they have these two re retail outlets. They also sell a huge percentage of their product to um, retailers that are very big. Um, some of you may have heard of Fab India or Anoki. 60% um, of what they do, what the ladies make at Sadhana goes to Fab India. So, and this is a, a very large retail chain that's, again, it's very much directed towards urban, you know, middle and upper class urban women in India and to Western consumers. Um, so that means that um, while every piece that they do at Sadhana does include some embroidery on it that relates back to um, indigenous traditions, but, and this is just, I, I didn't take a lot of pictures in the shop, I should have. A few examples, these are all shawls. And they're, you know, it's beautiful, but you can see that the, the embroidery is pretty limited. Like, small portions of the object are embroidered. This is a kurta that Sadhana does. Again, it's clearly marketed for, you know, these very middle class, urban, um, young Indians uh, and to foreigners. Um, so it incorporates embroidery, but um, this is what somebody would traditionally wear if they were making it, you know, for their dowry, for themselves. Um, these kinds of colors, this is what, these were, this was in a village in Gujarat, uh, this is quilts that they use at home, right? Bright, bright colors and a lot of interesting kind of pattern contrast. This is a bullock um, blanket, right? But you get a sense of the color, this, this kind of all over treatment of the design. Really, really bright, really vibrant colors. Um, more quilts, again, and, you know, things like this, these kind of functional items. Um, so what what, is, what has happened is that there has to be, in order to make sadhana objects right, <coughs> sell, in order to make them marketable, they've had to tone down the colors. Um, they've had to really adjust the aesthetic. That's another um, quilts that were being washed in Nerona village. So we find that a lot of their objects, let me go back, you know, they're really um, much more muted um, they use a lot of earthy colors, a lot of muted colors, and they, um, 
they stay away from those really bright contrast and bright bold patterns and so and as you can see just in this couple of examples that I did have so there has to have been you know there's there's a change that's going on in what's being produced they're experimenting with different um, colors with different amounts of um, embroidery and there has been a real this kind of market focus that they have been able had to take really really has resulted in some dramatic shifts in the production of textile art as compared to what they would have traditionally been doing. So, you know, the embroidery on each piece is far simpler and far less detailed, again, just think about this, right, than would otherwise occur. So there's a kind of conscious alteration, a kind of paring down of traditional forms. But at the same time, right, it's really important that the pieces that they sell have embroidery on them because this is the sort of sign of being authentic, right? This is what makes it, um, it's, it's an authentic product, it's a handmade product, and it's one that sort of represents, in this case, Rajasthan, right, for the casual visitor, for the tourist, as well as for the urban upper class consumer <laughs> in Delhi, you know, who would never step foot in a village like this. So there's a lot that's going on with the changes in embroidery and other kinds of textile work that, um, you know, on the one hand have this really important aspect, I mean, the end of the day, it's getting money into the pockets of these women so that their lives improve. But what's still being worked out, I think, is what is the impact of this going to be on the future of these traditional textile forms? And as mass production has come along, in the villages, people, it's a lot easier just to buy cheap knockoff stuff than to, than to wear the traditional kind of homemade embroidered work. Now, in, when we move down to Gujarat, um, down here, we were right over here sort of, and we moved down into Gujarat. In particular, we were looking at, we spent some time in this Kutch area, and um, we visited several other NGOs whose focus has is also income generation for women via textile production, and particularly embroidery work. Many of these organizations, um, they're uh, uh, located in and around, here's Bouge. Uh, this area of Kutch, it's, it's a very interesting area. It's a very drought prone area. Um, it's situated in a strange kind of environment. Um, so, oops, sorry, you can see Right, how close the border of Pakistan is. We have, you know, this uh, gulf here, water all around, and all of this is this great salt desert, um, the great white salt, and there are salt march marshes um, throughout the the region. So it's a tricky kind of environment to farm, and it's one in, that has seen a lot of um, uh, periods of drought that. Um, ultimately have led to, for the need for women to have a kind of um, stable income source. This also, um, Kutch area has a really, really large um, range of different ethnic communities that live here. They've had, um, at the time of partition and uh, before and after, they received a lot of um, migrants from Pakistan um, and even from sort of the Punjab area. Um, but they also have a number of other sort of local ethnic communities. And in Gujarat, in this area in particular, dress, costume is absolutely an essential way of declaring your identity and defining your identity. So in Gujarat, you instantly know what community some, somebody's from by how they're dressed, by the kind of embroidery, the colors, the patterns, the stitching. Um, it's uh, the, the significance of textile work is, is really, really great here. Um, one organization in particular that we, we spent a lot of time with um, was an organization uh, called KMVS, the Kuch Mahila Vikas Sangatan. And their um, sort of sadhana version, their um, uh, income generation project, um, which is known as Kasa. Uh, it's now become a, a, like sadhana, it's become a freestanding kind of independent entity um, that is, um, again, in a self-sustaining uh, kind of cooperative um, structure owned by the many artists. And now employs about 1,200 women um, in 
throughout the Kutch region um, who are involved in doing um, embroidery work, in particular <coughs> textile work. KMBS began in 1989, and it began up in um, this, these way up in the northern, like close to the salt deserts, and we were right about here, is an area called the Bani Villages, and they were really suffering a great deal of drought, um, so much so that like the men in the village would leave either to try to find work someplace else or to um, graze their, find some place to graze the cattle, leaving the women back home alone, taking care of their children, taking care of the elders of the village, while they're also supposed to be staying in their houses. And so it became a very kind of an untenable situation for everybody involved. And KMVS was really born out of that environment. Um, women started to sell their handicrafts in order to sustain the family, things that actually had been passed down you know, from their parents, from their grandmothers. But because the women were from these very conservative environments, right, they're not supposed to be wandering off to the city to find a good market, basically the middlemen would come along and they'd pay these women a pittance and then resell the work. So the women weren't really getting any of the money. They were certainly not able to sustain the, um, the, their families. And at the same time, right, because this is products of a domestic environment, the kinds of works that were, that were created by women were heavily devalued. They weren't seen as art. They were just seen as, well, this is what some poor woman did, you know, so let's, let's just throw a few rupees at her. And again, of course, is the conservative nature of the villages in which they lived, um, in which they are basically tacitly forbidden to work outside the home. So on their own, the artists were unable to develop sales market avenues that would reflect the actual value of their work or to generate um, sustainable income. And that's when KMVS created CASAB. And to address the situation, to provide a way for them to sell their handicrafts without having to go through a middleman, without having to leave their villages, and so that the women could keep all the profits. And as an par initial part of this effort, KMVS, they've done a re a remarkable work. One of the first things that they did was to set up daycare so that women could attend training sessions and also just the women could come together in a community and talk about and identify the issues, the other issues that were important to them. And, and KMVS has done a lot of additional work to help address those issues. Um, the founders of Kasab are Pankaj, Pankaj Shah, <coughs> who you see here, and Mina Raste. Um, Mina has been working, uh, Mina was also one of the founders of KMBS, and she, they've been working together um, with these communities for some 25 years. And Pankaj and Mina explained that one of Kasab's key goals was not simply to just generate income, um, but to demonstrate that women's art, which again had typically been just sort of disregarded or treated as, you know, whatever, that it's actually very high quality. And that is a really um, strong key. It's a key aspect of these women's identities, community identities, and that was what Kassab wanted to preserve. Um, and so Kassab also recognized, right, each community has its own method of embroidery, its own colors, its own patterns, and its own stitches. And all of those, those distinctive, um, identifiable aspects were being sort of watered down through um, quick and dirty products that were being sold on the cheap, mass production, and other kinds of pressures. So part of what Kassab's goal is, is not simply to provide income for women, but to provide it in a way that really treats their work for what it is, which is art. Um, so each community, um, th again, it works very much like Sadhana, you have small groups of women who come together from a single village or a single community. Um, the designs are created from within that community, and um, uh, they decide what they are going to be making. I'm just going to, I have a ton of images. I think their work is fantastic. Now, like Sadhana, right, they had to make some adjustments to be saleable. And in particular, we see that in um, a change of colors. I think this sort of, again, these earthy kinds of colors, golds and reds and browns, are ones that appeal to the urban Indian and the Western tourist. And even 
the use of these, you know, adding these silk borders around them and turning them into wall hangings, right? This is, um, this is again, a modification that's had to be made in order for this work to generate, you know, to be saleable. Um, but at the same time, I think a lot of what they doing, they're doing is, is really preserving traditional designs and traditional types of stitch work. This is one of my favorite types. This is this ribari where it's actually, um, these are little, this is actually an applique that is then stitched into place. And these are just really, the photographs don't do it justice. They're really, really ter terrific designs. Here is a different, I think this is the ahir type of embroidery. Um, this is, I think this is more of the um, ribari. Um, so there's a wide variety of different types of um, stitches and design elements that are being preserved, but the quality is really remarkable. So unlike what we were seeing at Sadna, and I, I certainly don't knock Sadna, I completely understand it, you know, you see how much of, there's no empty space. It's all really um, heavily worked and very, very finely worked embroidery that's being done. Um, this, this is a typical example, right? This is a traditional, um, this is a dowry bag. This is a kind of groom's bag. And this is what the traditional form looks like. And this is the kind that Sadna, or excuse me, that Kassab sells. The colors have been really toned down. You know, the brightness, this sort of over-the-top um, <laughs> blinginess of the traditional form has really, has really been toned down. Um, but it still preserves, at least in this case, some of the shape, some of the traditional elements. And even more so are, you know, objects like this that reference the sort of traditional dowry bags, but in fact, perfectly acceptable for a fashionable urban lady to take when she's going out to dinner, right? It's a little evening kind of bag. And so this is, again, these kind of um, compromises that have had to be made um, in order for the work to, you know, to, to be marketable. But one of the things that I think is really interesting about what Kassab does, unlike a lot of the other NGOs, is that they do not sell or market the sort of pity angle, right? They don't sell the story of the women. And indeed, they have, they have one shop in Bouge, but most of their stuff is really sold through, um, not directly to consumers, but through other, uh, they, they'll sell to you know, shops in London or New York who then resell it um, and make them into quilt covers or that sort of thing. So it's, it's an interesting, um, it's a very different approach from what we see at Sadna and some of the other organizations, which is, much less about you know, preserving the original quality and more about getting it out to the tourists and getting it out um, to sort of the broader market. This is um, a woman named Nawa who is um, from a very traditional community there in um, Kutch. She has risen through her work with um, Kassab to become a kind of project uh, manager and she works as an artist liaison. And so she, she comes into the main office in Bouge and gathers that material. Here she is creating um, kits that are going to go out. She's going to take out to women in villages who are going to then be making these, these little dolls. Um, so she's an, um, another really a terrific example of, of, again, her story has really sort of changed dramatically since she has been, had this, um, this kind of role. And one of the things that KMVS does with these, um, these, these women artists, um, again, is to really work with them in a number of other aspects of their life. So not only, you know, sort of the embroidery work is a kind of first step in the income generation, but one of the things that I think was really interesting that they have founded now in, in Bouge is a 24-hour hotline for women who are um, victims of domestic violence. And this is pretty remarkable. Um, and what's even more remarkable about it is the location of this facility is now in, in one of the main police stations in Bouge. And so they've had to train the police to actually consider that domestic violence is something that you know it's the job of the police to intervene in. And they've also created this legal wing that then can help, can counsel women and their husbands and their families about what to do. And that, it's, um, that doesn't seem like such a big deal from an American perspective, but it's a big deal. 
It's a really big deal. And um, I think in particular training the police, right, um, has been a big part of that. But that um, has come about because of these groups of women in each of the artist kind of communities who come together a lot a lot of times in the village they'll work together and they'll talk about these are the issues that that are pressing these are the problems that we have and so KMBS and Kassab have been able to address a lot of that and I really think that you know Kassab's work um, even though it has been you know completely modified for the market there's it's definitely been modified for the market um, is still preserving the nature of this as an art form. And I think the high quality of workmanship and of craft, I have just uh, <coughs> seen, you know, ten of these images I could show you, um, sets it apart from the kind of work that someplace uh, like the NGO Sadna is doing. It's a very distinct kind of thing. So um, I guess the last thing that I, I wanted to sort of throw in to complicate this or to you know add another layer is the um, and in particular in terms not only of, of creating income for women, but also in preserving the quality of artistic forms is the impact of tourism uh, on the textile traditions, particularly in the Kutch region. During the height of the season from about September, October through to February, the, there is, and you could Google and you'll probably find 15 different, 20 different companies that do this, these tours that are all about going to find this authentic kutch, go off into the villages and meet the authentic artists who are working in this way. And so there's, um, it's, it's a huge machinery. This is one of the villages that receives, um, this is a little house in a little tiny village in the middle of nowhere. It's Dordo village we visited. This was um, this wonderful artist. Her mother and her grandmother were also very, very good artists. She's very shy, you see. <laughs> she didn't want to be photographed. And I, we bought a couple of pieces from her. This is in her house. Um, Cynthia actually bought this piece, I think, right, that's being held up there. I bought so much stuff. I don't even know. I think I did buy that. <laughs> All of these pieces are made by Sophia. This, I actually bought this red one, but she, her work is very high quality, but she also said that, you know, she, they didn't know what to do with us because we were there in August. No <laughs> foreigners would ever go there, and where's our bus, right? And where, there's a huge tourist mechanism, tourist industry that has been built around this, finding this you know, authentic Gujarat, this authentic kutch. And these textiles, this is another village we went to, same kind of thing, they got stacks of stuff. This is a lovely, lovely woman who made us lunch. Um, but you know, they, their whole, like she's like, well we don't, we don't have to sell anything because in, in, in December, some busload of people is gonna come and they're gonna buy out my entire stock. And, right? and I just have to interrupt briefly, that is our really bored drive. <laughs> Yes. What is wrong with these women? <laughs> so this whole idea of the tourist component, I think, you know, really complicates things. And we did find that, um, like for example, this quilt here is something that is very traditional that Vera Ben would use in her own house. But most of what she sells, right, are these like little purses. They are like little cell phone purses that have some embroidery on it, but they have the, the silk, right? It's nothing to do with a kind of traditional form. And so it's this whole, there's this whole kind of machinery of manufacturing for the tourist and for the urban Indian an authentic art, which doesn't, right? This is tr traditional pieces, and these are the kinds of pieces that are sold to the tourists. So, you know, it's, to me it's a really, there's a number of interesting aspects of this work as the income generation and the social change is fantastic, um, but sometimes I think there is a dramatic expense at the price of pre preserving the real work, and the real skill, the quality, um, the original vision of these artists. And that's a very open-ended kind of concluding statement, and it's a, you know, but, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that.